everyone. This is Jason from Primetime Aquatics. Today, we're going to be talking about Neolamprologus multifasciatus. Yes, that name is this long. And so we're going to be calling them Maltese because that's what they're commonly called by people who keep them. And they're from Lake Tanganyika in Africa, which is a lake that has relatively hard water and a high pH. And so we're going to look at how to care for these fish, the types of tanks that they can go in. We'll look at how they breed. So stay tuned. All right, everybody. So here we see uh, the multifasciatus tank that we have, the multi tank that we have. This is a 50 gallon low boy. This is a great tank for multis because it's four feet long and it's two feet wide and it's only 10 inches high. And multis tend to like the bottom part of the tank anyway. And so this, as soon as I saw this tank, it's made by Zoomed. I knew I had to have it for these multis. And so far it's worked out well. And you can see here, uh, I've got a small colony of them. I started with 11 of them and they were juveniles. And over the last, I would say maybe two months, uh, they have produced 17 additional fry. So they look pretty happy. They seem pretty happy if they're breeding. Uh, in terms of size, the male at the top of the screen that you see right there, he's maybe an inch or an inch and a quarter. Uh, the females tend to stay a little bit smaller. And so they're going to be, maybe if, they're, if you're lucky, they'll top out in an inch. Females tend to not have as much yellow in the fins, but other than size and that little bit of yellow color, it's really difficult to tell the two apart. At least I found it's difficult to tell them apart. You almost have to wait until you have two fish that spend a little time together and then eventually you'll see the females kind of staking out an area like this little fish that you see just kind of coming in the screen there uh, that was a female that's her area that's where she produces her fry and she doesn't move from those that group of shells in the in the left hand corner here uh, that's that's the area where she has and cares for her babies now in terms of their temperament these fish get a little tricky uh, and the reason for that is they tend to at least in the tank that I have, they tend to tolerate one another fairly well. They don't really tolerate other fish particularly well, especially if they're in breeding mode. And so that's something you have to keep in mind. Uh, in this tank, I've got a small rainbow fish. I've got basically some leftover fish I had from another community tank where their, you know, the schools had died out. So I've got a rummy nose and I've got a neon. And I know it sounds strange to have those in there, but when I first got the fish, they were very scared. So these, the Maltese spent all their time in the shells and those fish, because they didn't hide, uh, brought them out of the shell. And now that they've done their job, they're gonna go somewhere else because I think they'd be happier in a different tank, even though for the most part, the Maltese leave them alone. Uh, unless they get too close to the babies and they kind of chase them away, but you can see none of those fish are fin nipped or anything like that. Uh, if you're going to have fish that are kind of towards the bottom of the tank, I don't know if that's going to work out, right? So I, this was definitely not a setup we'd want to put some quarry cats or even a pleco. I don't. This is one of the very few tanks in my fish room where I don't have a bristle nose, and the reason for that, I had a small bristle nose in there, and it was fine for a while, and then all of a sudden they decided that that bristle nose was not going to be there anymore, and I had to remove it before it got killed and it was like within a matter of it just seemed like a half a day they decided that it just it didn't belong so if you're going to have these fish understand that the bottom part of the tank is theirs now because they're so small a lot of people like to try and keep them in 10 gallons and 20 gallons 20 gallons are great either 20 high or 20 long the 10 gallons might be okay for a few but if you've got multiple males that may not be enough space for them to kind of stake out their own territory so you just have to kind of watch that and the other thing you'll need to think about there isn't a lot of height to a 10 gallon tank and so if you've got other fish there they may not tolerate that either so if you're going to put these guys in a 10 gallon tank i would suggest start out with just a few see how it works you know if you've got a male and a female you might be okay if they start having babies you'll probably have to remove those at some point but other fish added to that little 10 gallon tank might not work. Even a 20 long, it's not very high, so there's not a lot of space to add other fish. Now, if you move up to, let's say a 55 gallon or something a little taller, maybe like a 37 gallon where it's, it's a pretty tall tank, you may be able to have some fish at, that are primarily top water fish and the Maltese will have their bottom area and that might work out pretty well. And some people, they'll keep Maltese with um, Cypochromus leptosoma because those cichlids tend to stay a little bit higher up in the water column and so they don't tend to really interfere with one another. Uh, so just keep that in mind while these fish are small they can be somewhat aggressive towards other fish and if they're protecting babies 
even as small as they are, they will protect them with their lives. Uh, so in terms of the food that we feed them, in fact, in this video, you can kind of see, I think I was must have fed them uh, a little bit earlier in the before I shot the video. There's a little bit of flake food at the top. They eat it. Uh, I feed them uh, Hikari micro pellets. They like that. Uh, you can see right here, there's a little bit of frozen brine shrimp. Believe it or not, within a couple hours, that will all be gone. I put it there because there's some fry. There's a really tiny little fry underneath that in between those two shells. You can basically just see his two eye spots. But, you know, so the frozen foods like brine shrimp work great. This tank gets a decent amount of live baby brine shrimp, so I can feed out the fry here. And I've just found that the live baby brine shrimp encourages fish to breed, especially these guys. It just seems like they breed so much more when they have that steady diet of live food. Uh, but, you know, the standard flakes, pellets, they'll eat that stuff. Uh, frozen brine, live brine shrimp, uh, they enjoy that as well. Uh, in terms of temperatures, I keep this tank right around 78 degrees. In fact, at some point in this video, you'll see that I kind of focus it on the thermometer just so you can see it. But usually you're going to want upper 70s with the Maltese. If, the, if this is a fish where if the water parameters aren't consistent, it's probably not going to do well. This is not a fish you want to introduce to a brand new tank unless you've got something, uh, a filter that's already cycled or some gravel or sand that's already been cycled. Really, these guys want sand, but not a good fish for a brand new fresh tank. Uh, they're going to want, they don't do well with ammonia in the tank. They don't do well with nitrites in the tank. Nitrates for this tank never really goes above 30 to 40 parts per million, and that's really pushing it. And so this tank, it's a one water change uh, every week. And I, I change out about 20%. Uh, with this fish, it's not a really good idea to do very large water changes. So I try to keep the water changes uh, a little bit, you know, maybe 20% max. And then if I had to do more, I would probably do that 10% to 20% more frequently rather than do like a big 40 or 50% water change once a week. It's just not something they respond well to. pH, these fish come from Lake Tanganyika, and Lake Tanganyika has a pH that can be relatively high. It can get up to around 8.5, maybe slightly more. The pH in this tank is right around 8.2, and they're very happy with that. In terms of water hardness, Lake Tanganyika has uh, fairly hard water. I'm lucky where I live in Chicago, and the water out of the tap is decently hard. Again, total dissolved solids, TDS, is right around 170. When I measure that tank with a TDS meter, it's coming out way over 500, 550. Uh, you take away the you know 40 parts per million of the nitrates, and so you're left with other things. Again, TDS doesn't tell you everything that's in there. It doesn't tell you carbonate hardness, but it gives you an indication that there's stuff in the water, and I know there's not a lot of waste, and so we've got that big rock feature. We have the shells uh, that are releasing uh, minerals into the water, and so again, they seem to be pretty happy with the way things are set up. Um, in terms of the, you know the hardscaping and things like that, you saw in, the, in you, you seeing in the video, I've got the big rock feature. And really, when they were young, they kind of hung out there. For the most part, that's not something that they typically do. In fact, it's more serving now as a, a line of sight block than anything else. So I can establish multiple breeding pairs, or, or not necessarily even pairs, but multiple breeding locations and not have any issues but the shells are key if you're going to keep shell dwelling cichlids like the like a multi lots of shells and so I've got probably three dozen shells and they're probably more and they're all going to stake out their little area uh, sand is a must with these fish you can't really do gravel because they if you watch them if you look at the tank there are mounds of sand everywhere and I can promise you when I set that tank up all the sand was completely level. The shells were all spaced out. Now, I knew they would make that tank their home, but it was a typical, like, perfectly, you know, landscaped sort of tank. And within a few weeks, they had mounds of sand everywhere, and they bury some shells, and then some shells they want to put on the, you know, the bare bottom and things like that. I have found the females typically like to have a bare area around some of the shells that they're uh, going to have uh, where they're going to be uh, housing babies. But sand is a must. Uh, the sand that I use in this and almost all my tanks in the fish room is just pool filter sand. I got it from Menards, 50-pound bag for, I, I want to say it was, it was less than $10, so it was a fantastic deal. Kind of a pain to clean at first, but it really works well, and it's a big enough grain where it doesn't cloud up the tank or anything like that, It provided you clean it. But shells, sand, uh, beyond that, 
you don't really need much else. If you have softer water, you're probably going to need something to harden that water up a little bit. They don't do particularly well in soft water, so maybe some crushed coral or you know some type of rock that's going to release a little bit of minerals into the water. But again, be consistent with the water parameters and you'll have uh, better luck with these fish. In terms of breeding, I basically just set up the ecosystem for them and they did the rest. So as long as the water parameters are good and your water quality is excellent, uh, they just kind of take care of things. Now what I have found when it's kind of interesting with the multis is they tend to have small batches of fry, at least mine do. Uh, the one active female in that, that left hand corner of the tank, she tends to have maybe three or four fry every, seems like every week, maybe two weeks, depending on, on what's going on. And they start out very tiny. Uh, that one picture with that little tiny fry and they're I mean they're difficult to see they they blend in well with the sand which I suppose is the idea uh, they don't grow particularly fast some of the juveniles that you see they're a couple months old and I would say they're three-eighths of an inch or so so they're they're a little bit of a slower growing fish but the food wise I I was feeding the the tank out with just crushed flake and and the micro pellets and the fry were growing and then I started adding in some live baby brine and I found they're growing a little faster and I've got more fry but I don't necessarily know if that's because of the the baby brine because they were eating the other stuff because they were surviving and growing uh, and I wasn't feeding any live foods at the time although again I think it's a it's a better thing to do uh, you can see here this is an interesting fish and a really kind of a fun one because the parents don't eat the fry and you know you sometimes you keep guppies and things like that and they have babies and then the next thing you know they're gone the nice thing about Maltese and a lot of cichlids but Maltese in particular is they don't prey on their fry but more than that they seem to have more of a, a colony mentality to how they raise the fry the female does not chase away other Maltese uh, other males will come into the area they don't pick on the fry or try to consume them the female doesn't seem to mind when other Maltese are there the only thing that she will protect against is like I said when that smaller rainbow or that neon or that rummy nose starts to get in the area she'll make it known that they can't be there but so it's pretty cool that you can raise these things up in a colony and that's why I like that 50 gallon tank because it provides enough space to watch them do that so they're going to all their mating rituals and the eggs and the tiny fry typically will stay in a shell until they're old enough to venture out. And it's kind of cool. As they get older, they venture a little bit further away from the shells, and pretty soon they kind of establish their own little area. So that's kind of nice. Now, just again, one thing to keep in mind, if you're going to try to breed these fish and you've got hang on the back filters or canister filters, you are probably going to need to put an intake sponge over the intake to keep the fry from getting sucked up. They do stay very close to the ground if not basically on the substrate surface uh, when they're young so it reduces that likelihood but still they're so tiny they could definitely get sucked up by that. Uh, in terms of you know things to watch out for again they're deceptively aggressive towards other fish if they're breeding. They don't appreciate other fish in their territories so again on, in smaller tanks and particularly in tanks that aren't going to be very high, you have to watch out for that. Now, again, you got a 29 gallon or a 37 gallon or a 55, maybe even a 40. Those tanks are tall enough where you might be able to have some fish at the top. But if there are fish that need to be at the bottom of that tank, there's, there, there could very well be a problem there. So uh, just something to keep in mind. So the Maltese, it's a great fish. They stay small. They've got a little bit of attitude. They're going to rearrange your tank. So if you're somebody who wants your tank to look perfect all the time and you want the sand to be exactly where it's supposed to be and the decorations to be where they're supposed to be, this may not be the fish for you because they are going to make that tank their own. If you love live plants, you're probably going to have to pot them if you want to keep them in the tank because if you try to plant them in the substrate, your substrate is going to look very different after a few weeks compared to when you originally uh, added it. So just something to keep in mind. Well, everybody, hopefully you found that useful. Uh, it's a great, the Maltese are great fish. We really love having them. Uh, it's something I think we'll have in our fish room for a long time to come. If you like this video, please subscribe. Please hit the like button. We really appreciate all the positive comments that you've been sending us and the encouragement. And we'll see you in the next one.